Christmas is a holiday to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And across the world, billions of people are celebrating it. But most would have little or no idea of the significance of this event they're celebrating, the birth of the most wonderful man who ever lived. And it's sad that people don't know of this real significance of this event. It's sad that the, uh, the Bible has no influence on Christmas because it was the birth of this child that brought hope to a hopeless world and salvation for all who would follow him. You'll see shopping centres, businesses and homes begin displaying nativity scenes as a part of their decorations, showing a baby in a manger surrounded by his parents, three wise men, perhaps a few shepherds, maybe even a friendly donkey or a goat. And yet even this is not an accurate depiction of the events that took place. And it gives no indication of what it really means for us. So during the next few minutes, our goal is to briefly explore the birth of Jesus Christ and to find out why it is one of the most exciting events in history and how that can change the future for you and me. So the story begins, as we read tonight, with the visit of an angel to a young Jewish woman named Mary. And he brought a message from God to her, a special promise that would change her life and the course of human history. Let's explore this promise briefly. It was a promise made, as we've said, to a woman named Mary, a promise that she would give birth to a son unlike any other the Son of God. And we read this in the Bible at Luke chapter 1, as we did tonight. And if you have your Bible with you, feel free to follow along. And we'll read there that the angel Gabriel is sent to Mary to tell her of the promise. And he says in verse 30 of Luke chapter 1, The angel Gabriel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Mary's not yet married. She has had no physical relations with a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest, that is God, shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which is born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now there's a lot in this promise, much more than simply telling Mary that she'll have a son. So let's piece it together a little bit at a time. And the key point, really, of this prophecy begins with the miracle of the child born to Mary. How would it all come about? Well, the angel Gabriel has said unto her, Fear not, thou hast found favour with God. So God specially chose Mary for this incredibly important role. And he chose her for two reasons. Firstly, she was a godly woman. And secondly, because she was in the ancestral line of King David, who we'll talk about in a minute. And he goes on to say, the angel says, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son. And then said Mary unto the angel, How will this be, seeing I know not a man? So Mary, as we've said, she was unmarried. She'd never been in a physical relationship with a man. It would naturally be impossible for her to have a child. And so if she was to have this son, something miraculous had to happen. And the angel answers Mary straight away. He comes right back and he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon thee, and the power of the highest, that is God, will overshadow thee. So Gabriel tells Mary that this is exactly what will happen. It will be miraculous. The child would be conceived by the power of God rather than the involvement of a man. And the outcome of this was the most amazing and unique child ever born. 
he would be the son of God. Therefore, the holy thing which is born of thee shall be called the son of God. And then he goes on with some of the finer details. You shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. So the child would be a boy and he would be named Jesus. And the name Jesus in the Hebrew is Joshua. And it means Yah saves or God will save. And the apostle Matthew in his book that he wrote says that he was called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And his people, they are the house of Jacob, that is Israel. Luke writes, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So he will be a king, he will reign over Israel and his kingdom would never end. In the course of time then, Mary's pregnancy comes to full term and in chapter two of Luke, we read that she gives birth to this promised son, just as the angel had said, and he's given the name Jesus. And this child was the salvation brought by God for all people. Jesus is the critical part of God's plan to save people like you and I and heal our relationship with himself. Remember in Luke uh, chapter 1, we read that Jesus would reign forever over Israel, the house or the family of Jacob. But there was no kingdom of Israel when Jesus was born. So this must be talking about a time in the future. Now Luke uses an interesting phrase to describe the kingship of Jesus. He says that he will sit on the throne of his father David. I suppose there's two questions based on that. What is the throne of David? And how come David is called his father when we just read that God was his father? Well, to answer the first question, the throne of David refers to the dynasty or the royal line of succession. It's David's royal lineage. It's the equivalent of us saying the, the house of Tudor or the house of Windsor. It would be like saying the throne of Windsor. So the kingship of Israel after David was from his family. All of his family sat on the throne of David. And Jesus Christ also is one of David's descendants. So to understand the second part relating to David being his father, we need to come back to the Old Testament of the Bible, to a promise made to King David, one of Israel's greatest kings. And this promise is recorded for us in 2nd of Samuel and chapter 7, if you would like to go there. And particularly, the part we want to consider is from verse 12 to 14. So King David has decided he wants to build a house or a temple for God. And in 2nd of Samuel 7, God answers David and tells him that he won't be the one to build God a house, but that he, God, will build David a house. And this wouldn't be a physical house, but rather a house of people. It was a, a family that would be established. So picking up the message that God um, sends to David by Nathan the prophet, we read in verse 12 of, uh, of 2 of Samuel chapter 7, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, so when you grow old and you die, David, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne at the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Notice God says, I will establish his kingdom, and I will be his father, and he will be my son. So beyond this promise of a greater family, there is one individual singled out as a part of this promise. He's the one who would be the king, which would sit on David's throne forever. And if we read a little further down in verse 16 of 2nd of Samuel 7, this same sentiment is repeated for us because of its importance. Thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. 
the throne or the royal succession of the family of David would be established forever. This is the exact language that was used in Luke 1 to describe Jesus, the Son of God. And that's because this seed promised to David is Jesus. He is the descendant spoken of in 2 Samuel 7, who would be the seed or descendant of David, yet also the Son of God. And this future king, Jesus, would rule forever on the throne of Israel. The, the fact that Jesus would be established as king before David or in his presence indicates that David would be raised from the dead when Jesus becomes king. So clearly Jesus was destined by God to be an immortal king, as shown in Luke 1 and 2 Samuel 7. To rule forever, he must be immortal. But if Jesus was to be king of Israel forever, then how will this be? There was no kingdom of Israel, nor was Jesus ever king when we read the story of his life. In addition, we're told that following his resurrection, he went to heaven, where he currently is with his father, with God. Well, let's once again look to the Bible for the answer. And this time it can be found in the Acts of the Apostles, right at the beginning. Acts 1 and verse 6. The disciples ask if the Lord Jesus is going to restore the kingdom of heaven, uh, the kingdom of Israel, sorry, because it no longer existed at this time. They say, will he restore it then and there? But his response to them is one that the time is not to be known exactly by man, and he tells them that no one except God knows when the kingdom will be set up. It is up to us to prepare for it and wait that time. And having told this to his disciples, Jesus then ascended to heaven where he currently is. And all of that, that's happened in the past already. But now we get to the part of our topic that really interests us for the future. In verse 10 of Acts chapter 1. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, so while the disciples are standing there and they're gazing up into heaven, watching where their master, the Lord Jesus, has just disappeared from their sight, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. And these are angels, two angels, messengers of God, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And there it is. That's the answer we've been looking for. In just the same way that Jesus went up into heaven, someday very soon he will return back to the earth to set up the kingdom of God and to fulfill the promise made at his birth. So how is Jesus going to rule over the house of Jacob forever? He's going to come back to the earth just as the angels told the disciples when he ascended from them. If the Lord Jesus is going to be an immortal king, reigning forever, what kind of ruler will he be? What will his kingdom be like? Well, once again, it's time for us to go looking in the Bible. And this time, it's back to the Old Testament again, at Psalm 72. We're going to read through the whole psalm to give a bit of sense before going into the explanation. But before I do this, let's list a few things, some of the elements that make up a kingdom. And we'll see how the kingdom Jesus rules will compare. A kingdom has a king, the equivalent of a president or a prime minister, some sort of a ruler. There's a term of government or the lifespan of a monarch. There's territory covered by a kingdom. There are citizens in the kingdom. There's laws and a justice system. There's social security, food security, and sometimes environmental protection laws. And these are just a few things which kingdoms are comprised of. So let's read through the psalm now and see what this kingdom will be like. Psalm 72, a psalm for Solomon. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people 
and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grasses, as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish, and abundance of peace, so long as the moon endures. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For he shall deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name for ever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So, first up, what aspects of a kingdom can we see there? How many points which we listed above? We have a king, Jesus Christ. The term of his rule is forever. He is immortal, so he will never die or be replaced. The territory covered will be the whole world. Their citizens spoken of, all the people of the earth. Jesus will uphold a perfect justice system, the law of God. There is social security because the king protects all his citizens from their oppressors. There is food security. The earth will provide abundantly and there is the ultimate environmental protection because the whole earth is completely renewed to pristine condition. Now let's pick out a list of everything in that psalm relating to what kind of king Jesus Christ will be. And some of them are repeated and partly this is because psalms are poetic but also because this, this, uh, these points are important. Jesus will judge with righteousness and judgment. He will judge the poor, save the needy, and destroy oppressors. Jesus cares for all, and he will not ignore those who need it most. Today, poverty, hunger, homelessness, and many other inequalities are rife amongst humanity, and nothing lasting is done about it. Humanity has found no solutions that seem to work for the problems facing us. Jesus Christ will put an end to that. He will truly care for all those in need. He'll be like rain on mown grass, watering the earth, refreshing like new life. He will have dominion over the whole earth. So his kingdom will be the entire world, not just the land of Israel. His enemies will lick the dust. So this king will have total power over all his enemies, there will be no threat to him. And all who are his enemies will be in subjection to his reign. All kings will bow to him, and all nations will serve him. All the rulers of the world will become subject to Jesus Christ, and he will be the ruler of all the nations, the king of the whole world. And again, it's repeated that he will deliver the needy, the poor, and the helpless. Three times we're told that Jesus will be the saviour 
to help those who are the poor and the needy, those who cannot help themselves. It's very clear that there is an emphasis on him doing things which the leaders of our world until now have failed to do. This is a ruler like no other. The world has never seen a ruler like this. And in the words of the psalm, he will redeem the needy from deceit and violence. We recently had a funeral for the Queen of England. But for Jesus, there will never be a funeral because he lives forever. He'll be given gifts at his return by the remaining leaders from around the world and he will be loved. And we know Jesus will be loved because you don't pray for someone and bless them daily if you don't love them. And these things both occur for Jesus Christ. His name will endure forever, not in the history books, but as the current ruler, the king of all kings, and all of his people, so the entire world will be blessed in him. It will be obvious to everyone that God is with him and that he is blessed. So that's the main points the psalm tells us about the kind of king Jesus will be. But what else does it say about the kingdom he will rule? The state of the earth when his kingdom is set up. The huge mountains, the little hills will bring peace. There will be peace throughout all the earth from the greatest to the smallest of creation. The psalm says the righteous will flourish and there will be an abundance of peace for as long as the moon lasts. That first part means that those who are righteous, in other words, those who live their lives in a way that God asks us to, showing his character, they will be blessed and all they do will prosper. And then we jump down to verse 16 of the psalm. There will be a handful of corn at the tops of mountains now, the tops of mountains aren't really known to be particularly great spots to grow things, especially not crops for food. So this really says a lot about the state of the earth and of nature when Jesus is ruling. If food is growing in the desert-like environment at the top of mountains, just imagine how things will be growing down in more fertile areas. And the fruit of the earth is a Bible term for the life that grows Trees, plants, crops, fruit, vegetables, all these things. And Lebanon in the times that this psalm was written by David was known for its many trees and incredibly productive and fertile plant life. So this is another picture used to describe just how amazing and productive the earth will be at the time Jesus is king. You imagine grass growing everywhere. It's thick, it's lush, it's healthy. That's how the people of the world will be. They will thrive like that grass. The kingdom of God, ruled by his son, Jesus Christ, is not going to be anything like any other kingdom now or in history. It will be so much better than any other time we've known. God is the creator of the earth and everything on it, including us. And that means that he alone is capable of healing it completely and restoring it to a state much better than before, as it so desperately needs. And the king who will rule this fantastic new world is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was born in a humble manger. So friends, hopefully you've seen tonight that Jesus was born to be a king. And the Bible tells us all about it. The king he will be, the kingdom he will rule. And it even shows us that this was promised a long time before Jesus was born. We've had a glimpse of the amazing time when Jesus will rule, when he returns to the earth to be the king. And during all this, although I haven't specifically emphasized it, there's been two consistent themes that we've discussed. We've spoken about Jesus, about his name, and we've spoken about the kingdom he'll rule, the kingdom of God. And I'd like to show you something else exciting now related to these themes. In your Bibles, if you have one with you, find Acts 8 and verse 12. And we'll read what it says there. 
in Acts 8 and verse 12. Just a little bit after what we read before about Christ, uh, Jesus ascending to heaven. Acts 8 and verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised both men and women. So Philip, an apostle of Jesus Christ, is preaching to a group of people. That's who the they are here. And he was preaching about the exact two things we've been discussing tonight. And when people heard this, they believed it and they were baptised. So what is it that Philip was preaching to them? Well, further down in the same chapter, Acts 8 and verse 25 and they, the apostles, down at the end of the verse, preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So the apostles were preaching the gospel. What was the gospel? What's it all about? Well, it's the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So just very briefly tonight, we've skimmed over the things of the gospel. Why is this important, though? Well, after Jesus was raised from death, just before he ascended to heaven, he came and he saw his disciples. And in Mark 16 and verse 15 and 16, he speaks to them and he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to all people. He that believes and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. This means that the question for everyone listening to this is, do you choose to believe the name of Jesus Christ? Will you find out more about his life, his work and his promised kingship? And do you choose to believe that Jesus will return to the earth to set up the kingdom of God and to be its king? Jesus Christ will be the most wonderful the fairest, the most consistent, the kindest, the most loving, and the only perfect king this world has ever seen. The kingdom he rules will be incredible. The earth will be entirely renewed, and true peace will finally exist from the greatest mountains to the littlest hills through the whole earth. And if you want to be part of this kingdom, then hear the words that God has spoken to us through the Bible. Read it, learn it, believe it. And once you believe, be baptised, because that is the natural result of your belief. And you can be saved by baptism to become part of the wonderful future soon coming when Jesus returns.